So I'm going to start. My name is Tom DeGiorgio. I am the uh, chairman of the Economic Development Council. I also happen to be the chairman of the Broward Planning Council. So I know a little bit about planning, kind of like, kind of like Rex. Um, but we have some specialists here with us. From, from starting on my right or your left looking, it's Kim Briesmeister, who is uh, one of the principals of RMA, and she's a consultant with the city. We have Jeannie McIntyre. Jeannie's the uh, president and CEO of the Chamber of Commerce. We have Dennis Bedley. Dennis is uh, the president of Seacoast Bank. Next to Dennis, we have Eric Liff. Eric is a partner with the Lambert Advisory Group. He's a principal there. Next to, next to Eric, we have Dave Coddington. Dave's a senior vice president for business development with the Greater Fort Lauderdale Alliance. Next to Dave is Kona Gray. Kona is a principal at EDSA, specializing in architecture and urban design. And finally, a great friend of ours, the executive director of the planning council for Broward County, Barbara Blake Boy. The way this panel is going to work is Kim and I are going to ask some questions. We have some specific questions for specific panelists. And then at the end of the panelist answer, anybody can feel free to add on or weigh in to what the question was. OK? I'm going to start off. I want to introduce Jeannie first. This is for you. Jean McIntyre, like I said, is the president and CEO of the Greater Pompano Beach Chamber of Commerce. The mission of promoting business, enhancing community, and community development. Jean is currently chair of the Broward County Small Business Advisory Board and chair of the Broward Education Foundation. She serves on numerous business boards, Greater Fort Lauderdale Alliance, Greater Fort Lauderdale Chamber, and the Tower Forum. She has chaired chamber boards in both Sunrise and Pompano Beach, and she serves on the Economic Development Council in the city. You've been very, very busy. And the chamber's been very, very busy over the last 25 years, really helping shape the city. In your opinion, what you've seen, because you've been a part of it for at least 10 or 15 years here in this city, what have we done well, and what do we need to look out for in the future? Thank you, Tommy. Um, I think what we've done well is we have thought about our growth in a very thoughtful manner. Uh, we did not <clears throat> just throw up areas or communities. We targeted specific areas. And we did a lot of outreach and communication. And we spent a lot of time talking to the community and engaging with folks and explaining what was going to happen and really helping everybody share this vision. Um, <clears throat> because that's what it is. I think that's what we were fortunate enough to see today was a vision of what a community can be. And I think that's what we've all been experiencing here in Pompano Beach um, is that vision. Thank you very much. Kim. Great, thank you. Um, for those of you, you know, obviously that have been here a long time, and residents in particular, um, you've probably enjoyed watching your city grow um, over the last decade or so in a way that it hadn't many years in the past. And I think what was so impressive about Joe's presentation is that he introduced the next phase of what will be an incredible opportunity for us to set the direction of the next phase of growth for our city, and in particular the downtown. Um, it comes with much higher stakes, um, fiscally and economically. Um, but I can say, having come from the redevelopment world and been in, in the redevelopment business for three, four decades, it is an incredible time that this city's at to really set its future. Um, and I know when we were working on the beach 10 years ago and first started those dialogues, um, a lot of the panelists that are here, either them, their partners, or, or even them themselves were involved in making those decisions for the beach. And, and now we get to enjoy that as a, just a beacon of what good growth and good economic development can, can do. So um, I think it's real exciting to be at this point in our city's future. So um, I'm gonna introduce Dennis. I, I can tell you that the lending community and the financial markets um, make all the difference in the world of how projects get financed um, and how they view um, financing projects that are going to come into this city. Dennis um, started Legacy Bank, and I think you actually had a couple Bompano branches in there. Um, and uh, then later on went on to um, Seacoast Bank when it was acquired. 
Um, and then you also served as the CEO of Southern Community Bank. So you've got a very, very deep bench of, of, of banking background locally. Um, talk to us a little bit about what you see happening in not only Broward County, but maybe even a little more micro in Pompano. And based on what you just heard Joe talk about, um, what do you see coming down the pike as far as growth and, and tying that into the lending community? So can you hear me? Uh, thank you, Kim. Uh, I grew up in Fort Lauderdale, and I've been a resident for over working in the community for nearly 40 years. So part of me sometimes is a little sad to go west of 441, where I used to ride horses and pick strawberries and oranges as a young boy to see what's going on out there. because. Uh, you know, I do remember the past, but uh, the past is great, but we also got to look forward to the future. And listen, Florida is on fire. I mean, it's exploding as a state, and you all probably seen your home values doubled or tripled in, in value, and that's, that's, that's terrific. And people are going to continue to move here because of the, the, the you know, no state income tax and the great weather and blah, 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 blah. You know all the reasons why. So it's an exciting place. It's an exciting place for, for us as bankers because, uh, listen, uh, we love to lend on real estate. We love the growth because that's how we make our money. There aren't a lot of manufacturers, there aren't a lot of distributors in this community. So what do banks typically lend on as we lend to folks like you uh, as you're buying your first residence or your, your, your next uh, place? But we also do a lot of the development work too. So we are excited about what's going on here in the state of Florida, and we're particularly excited to be uh, doing business in Broward County. As Kim said, I, I sold my last bank last year, and I did have an office on, on Pyreline and McNabb. Pompano's a, a great community. We we're excited to be here, but uh, this is a great place. We're nestled between uh, two great counties in Palm Beach as well as, as Dade County, and we have the best of both worlds. Um, the infrastructure is going to be an issue, but I think we're going to have come up with solutions like Brightline and other areas but where we need to have public transportation and stuff to alleviate some of the transportation issues. But I'm really excited and very positive about the future, Kim. Any crystal ball where interest rates are going? Up. up. <laughs> <laughs> you probably saw the, the, the Home Depot and the Walmart results today and uh, it just shook the market up. Uh, Everybody thinks that Jerome Powell was teasing by saying that he's going to raise rates and we're going to do a pivot and rates are going to come down. They're not. He's going to continue to raise rates until we get inflation under control and then you might see some slowdown. So I don't see rates even stopping or slowing down until 2024. We're going to continue to see uh, probably a 50 basis point increase at the next Fed meeting and continue increases. So it's going to continue for a while because he's he is not going to be another Paul Volcker. He's going to make sure that uh, that he's not criticized for what he's done for inflation here in this country. Thanks, Dennis. Um, Dave, let's move on to you. Um, Tommy introduced you. You're senior vice president of business development at the Broward Alliance, very important organization um, in our county, and making sure that uh, South Florida in general, because I know you partner with your Miami and West Palm counterparts. Um, attract good growth um, and as we grow. Um, so you're focused really on attracting and retaining companies, but your targeted industries are life science, aviation, marine, and professional services. Um, again, Joe, Joe went through the different asset classes and types of, of what can be built in and around the city, um, but in the downtown. What do you see um, as far as growth opportunities and, and how could the Broward Alliance participate in, in downtown Pompano's growth? So I think that, uh, wow, that's loud. Um, that when you look at the different types of companies that we've helped attract, so we're the principal economic development organization and for 50 years the Broward Alliance, now Greater Fort Lauderdale Alliance about 10 years ago, but the, the piece of when we're attracting these target industries, and we go after target industries because they're high wage, high skilled jobs, right? So to Joe's presentation in reference to that, you see where that, that tax revenue that's coming into the city and the county is really increased. So. A couple years ago, we attracted Tektronic Industries. You might not know TTI, but you know everything they make. Milwaukee, Ryobi, Rigid, Dirt Devil, and the list goes on. They moved their headquarters from the Pennsylvania, Maryland area, or whatever, down to Fort Lauderdale. We just, uh, in the past year, moved West Marines HQ from California to downtown Fort Lauderdale. We moved Future Tech uh, Technology. You don't know necessarily Future Tech, but you'll know the companies they work with, like Northrop Grumman. Their CEO came down for their ribbon cutting about six months ago. Uh, they took a penthouse downtown Fort Lauderdale, 
But those things are drivers for us. And one of the interesting things that's changed in the last few years is that depending on what the company is and what that workforce looks like, they're either specifically suburban or downtown location. Technology companies, we just did Chewy HQ out in Plantation. They want a more suburban piece because that has the legacy and that workforce from Motorola for going back years. So the piece where Pompano comes into play as you guys look at this development is that is that an opportunity to attract more high skill, high wage jobs that are going to want to be in a denser area that's more walkable? And if you look around the county, be it what Coral Springs is trying to do, similar to what you guys are trying to do, or what Pembroke Pines is doing with their city center, or just you know go down the list, or what you showed with Hollywood. So that gives us the diversity and the opportunity to treat both types of companies that will attract workers. Chewy's gonna, if I get the number right, I think it's, over a thousand jobs, over seventy thousand dollars average wage, um, and when you look at that and that revenue base to what that does for the city and the county, it's it's significant. Excellent. Excellent. Um, I want to follow up on that uh, with Eric here. Just we talk about the density and talk about the downtown. Eric is, uh, as I mentioned already, he's a partner with the Lambert Advisory Group. Um, he spends most of his time consulting big companies, municipalities, and countries. I mean, this is, this is uh, someone in our backyard that really, his partner right now is in uh, New Jersey, consulting with the governor of New Jersey, Phil Murphy. So you've seen this. You see what we're trying to do, and you've been working here in the city of Pompano Beach with us for uh, at least 2007. Long so time. kind of expand on that density and, and that economic engines that's created on that with our downtown and the opportunities we have. Sure, sure. Thank you. Um, first of all, I, I have to say, as an economist, and I think Kona can attest to this, I could never perform. I mean, that was an extraordinary presentation to take that type of data, and really, it really was, uh, you know, a learning lesson for me, first of all. Uh, so, I really appreciate that context. Um, the, the, I'll take a step back, actually. Um, we had had been involved in, uh, in, in the city of Pompano Beach and the CRAs for quite a bit of time, uh, and particularly the, within the Northwest CRA. Um, and even as long ago as, say, I think it was about 2010 when we started, we realized that there was a very strong opportunity right off the bat for office potential. Um, it, you know, it's, it's just north of the Cypress Creek office market, uh, which is extremely strong. It's got the Boca market to the north. We realize that opportunity. We also understand that multifamily is also starting to strengthen. Now, obviously, things have changed over the last couple of you know, years and fluctuated, but the fact is, obviously, now we know where the markets are today and how strong they are for every single use. And so, um, you know, I don't... In terms of land value, I wouldn't even need to uh, reinterpret everything that was taught to, to us today. Um, but just to understand that there is tremendous opportunity. This is a gateway uh, property. Uh, it has access, it has visibility, it has great opportunity. The fact that the CRA and the city control a lot of the land creates tremendous amount of opportunity. Again, you start to look at the office, the mixed use, the jobs, the walkability, the housing, and you'll understand how that value is created. Uh, and and uh, I, you know, probably for, it, again, having been involved in it for so long, this really seems like a great opportunity and now that we're seeing the plan come together. Excellent. Thanks, Eric. Um, you know, when we start doing these projects, there's obstacles to come up. And our planning expert right next to me is Barbara Blakeboy. I told you she's the executive director of the planning council. She's been the executive director since 2012, and she's been on at the planning council since 2000. And you've been a member of the metric before that. You're part of the MPO for 1996. So you have some experience in this county with planning and understanding and seeing how other cities have done it well and how some have not done it so well. So you hear what we're doing. You kind of saw a little bit about our downtown in the past. What are some of the biggest obstacles that we're going to be up against? Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, one thing I'd like to say is, as Mr. DiGiorgio mentioned, I have had the privilege of working with Pompano Beach really since 2000, since I came to the, since I started with the Planning Council. And the evolution that I have seen just from a planning perspective is incredible. And I think the, most of the challenges that the city is seeing are, are going to be related to transportation. And you know, we have this idea in our head coming from this more suburban community that that means cars. But really, we're talking about tying in all of the pieces, cars, walkability, 
um, bicycle, trans, uh, transit, and other transportation options. So it's really keeping all of those things together and making sure that we're putting the pieces in place that the city needs to make them a success. And I think that's what we're seeing. We're seeing the city weave together the pieces. They're putting the planning in place. They've been working on on land use plans, you know, the future plan, comprehensive planning for 20 years since I started and we saw smaller parcels in the past 10 or 12 years. We've seen these larger areas grow from I-95 and along the corridor and it's really apparent that that's what's important to the city is creating an opportunity for its residents to be able to just enjoy their community outside of their car when they come home from work. If they don't work in Pompano, they're able to take those opportunities to enjoy open spaces, enjoy the public realm, enjoy the economy. And I think it, it, they're doing a successful job, but obviously I think transportation is probably one of the number one. And then also tie that in with resiliency planning, right? Climate change, Pompano Beach is on the coast. So those things tie together. You know, None of these are gonna in, be independent of each other. They all tie together. So I think transportation, resiliency planning, those are probably the, the biggest challenges. Excellent, thank you. Thanks, Barbara. Yeah, and another thing that Joe mentioned that was um, real important was that public realm. And it was the public realm and investing in the public realm, which I think this city has done a phenomenal job at, at paying attention to its public assets and, and those investments. Um, okay, Kona, let's go to Kona. Um, Kona is um, a fellow with the American Society of Landscape Architects, um, very talented architect um, with EDSA, uh, but has experience in over 30 countries, so he's quite diverse in his, uh, in his global ex experience. Um, his portfolio, though, is pretty broad also in multiple scales, and he focuses on communities, parks, hospitality, urban public realms, and mixed-use destinations. So let's hit on the urban public realm and the mixed-use destinations. Um, you hear a lot of this term smart growth. You hear the term complete streets. You hear urbanism. Um, boil down for the public when we're doing all this planning speak and transportation talk, et cetera. What does that mean to the community? What, what's coming? What does good urbanism and smart growth really look like? That's a really good question. I think it has a lot to do with um, utilizing your assets in a very smart way, not to use a pun on smart, um, but taking a value approach to it and not spreading it out and really looking at how you can concentrate those efforts, similar to what Joe was talking about, to allow you to really take advantage of that cost per, per, per acre um, and also that value per acre. Um, the term new urbanism has been floated around and I'm sure a lot of you have heard that before. This is going back to some of the downtowns and historic areas that you saw in cities where you, know, you had shops on the ground level, maybe an office on the second level, and residential above. It still works. And when you concentrate those efforts, it allows you to really take advantage of that and really you know, hone in to what is most important in terms of the development. And, and I think that's important um, because, again, as the, as the city makes decisions on zoning and growth and, and urban infill, I mean, that, that picture that you showed of all of that vacant land is, is just that. It's vacant. It's um, going to be open for development. And as we go through this discussion with the community about what does constitute a downtown, um, those good growth principles are going to come into play very quickly. Can I jump in real quickly? Because I just had a really interesting thought and it kind of tied into what Kona said and what Dennis said. Um, so, you know, we talk about liking what our downtown used to look like and how that looked. And I recall being at the Historical Society dinner and meeting a couple who are so excited because they are bringing a coffee shop back to our downtown Old Town area. And it originally was a coffee shop. So sometimes there can be some interesting symmetry in how that whole process goes around and um, if we just let it happen. So we've covered, um, we've covered some key questions that, I mean, this is a pretty esteemed panel with, with high degrees of, of um, experience in particular categories, but we have a couple just general questions before we wrap up. The cover of the Sentinel, or the front page of the Sentinel, was talking about um, how there's funding that's coming from the federal level on down to the different cities. And unfortunately, our county um, in the entire United States is viewed as one of the most unsafe cities and counties for pedestrians. Um, it's a problem. And 
you know, we can sit here and talk about urbanism and we can talk about growth and roads and smart growth and pedestrians, but bottom line is it's just not something that can be ignored. Um, so, you know, for, for all of you, and I'll just put that out there, um, the city has made some pretty, you know, bold and aggressive steps with some of its streetscape and infrastructure improvements in the past. They continue to do so with some of the street improvements that are underway today. Um, but are there some key things, you know, obviously none of us really want to own that, um, that pedestrian moniker for our county, um, but are, are there some key things that you see or think that um, the city could or should be doing to make sure that that connectivity is, is very broad and it really has the in, impact that we hope it's going to have, uh, which is make sure that people use, like Barbara was just saying, all modes of transportation and just change the way uh, that we are we are treating people that are walking, driving, biking, et cetera. Kona, I see you got that mic. Yeah, I mean, this is, this, <laughs> this is right in my wheelhouse. You know, it's, it's, it, I've been here for 26 years in, in South Florida, and I, I've lived in many cities, lived in Boston, and, you know, it, and you see the value of a walkable city where you can actually walk, and people are there, you know, adjacent in, their, in a shop or a, a sidewalk cafe or, you know, at their home that may be a brownstone or whatever it is. And it's just a different quality of life, you know. The sidewalks are shaded. It's hot here, right? And so if I walk, I mean, walking down Broward Boulevard or even Atlantic, it's not comfortable. You know, that's why people walk down Los Olas, you know, in that space, because it's a lot more comfortable. The work we did um, in the ECRA on your beach, you can see, you can tell the difference. I mean, it's walkable, it's comfortable, it's safe. You know, you even see kids running around because it's, it's, it just makes it better. And so a lot of this is common sense, you know, when we, when we put all this uh, attention into the cars and all this um, focus on moving people quickly, we lost sight of what living really is. You don't live in your car, right? Think about that. You don't live in your car. Um, I don't know if you guys have read Peter Kaganyama and his books For the Love of Cities. I mean, it's, it's, it's a really good attitude about what it takes to love a city. And when you love your place, it looks great. Thanks, Kona. Um, another thing that we're going to be focusing on, and, and our you know, CRA director did a great job today um, introducing Joe and at his presentation today about just recognizing not only just that, the, the safety, the transportation needs, um, but also the community input and making sure uh, that as we go through this process, community input's gonna be, gonna be a very, very important component of it. So um, I know you're very active at getting folks involved. Um, do you all have any suggestions um, for the city when it comes to community input? So I would just go back to the reference on Wakona and mentioning before about the companies that we worked with. We literally had a company come in, significant, if I said the name, you would recognize it. Unfortunately, we didn't land them, they went somewhere else. But the, the CEO literally said, we we're going for the best talent coming out of the universities, the top universities, it's all about tech. I literally want them to walk out the office door, go to the left, either go to their apartment or condo or whatever, or go to the right and go to a bar or restaurant or whatever. I, they won't have cars. 80% of them are probably going to Uber, this, that. They want that walkability. And so Pompano's got the chance to build a smart city or add on to that and make it. And those walkable pathways, the wider sidewalks, the shade, that is without a doubt one of the things that, exactly. It's so simple, the energy that comes from it, it's amazing, and those are some of the things that are so simple, but are direct quotes from the CEOs that we meet with. So one and of the questions we didn't ask was, do you think our downtown is a good live, work, play environment? I think you answered that question, so that was awesome. Um, you know, really the stakeholder engagement is important, and we're trying to do that here today. Nguyen and team, you did a fantastic job bringing Joe in, thank you, as Kim said. But any other ideas, Jeannie, something else we should be doing to get the stakeholders involved. What I mean by stakeholders are, are you the citizens, the business owners in the community, you the folks that live here now, you're the stakeholders. Yeah, I, I think if we've had a couple of challenges, sometimes it's, we talk about timelines that a pro projects like these happen, and they're long, right? We were talking about a 30-year window, a 10-year window, a 20-year window. And I think sometimes we forget that we haven't updated the community and we're moving into that second phase. 
And I think if we've gotten ourselves in a little bit of trouble, it was not that it wasn't communicated initially, it was that it was on a city timeline versus people timeline. Yeah, so, if, I, if I could just point. add very quick. Jump in. Um, you know, Kona, we've been fortunate enough to work together quite a bit. And just to go back to the community input, you know, one of the most important things I think is the education process, the organization of it. Um, and, you know, it's at a level now, I think that's unprecedented, at least from what I've seen in this community. Um, and, and obviously now, you know, going, you know, it's just, it's the physical planning, it's the economics, it's the finance, and importantly, it's the organization of the city and CRA itself, which, um, you know, is a, is a core component, but I think the, the, the fundamentals, it's, it's just what's going on today, and the education process is critical, and hopefully, and I know it will continue, so, and that's, again, now you're looking at something, you know, it's a little more of a blank slate in this area, in terms of the ability to create a community, uh, and it's now time to take advantage of that. Yeah. I just want to weigh in for a second, as Jean was saying, it's a people timeline. You know, uh, we have the good fortune of working on the very base layer of planning in Broward County, and it's also a misfortune because sometimes we get calls from citizens who are upset, and they have no idea that a city has been working, you know, to get to this point, even to make a land use change or modification for five, seven years, and the public output or input that they've been, um, and outreach that they've been seeking, and you know, newer residents weren't there; they didn't know about it, and that's when I think you see, see the most. So the best thing the city can do is keep the residents engaged and keep them informed and you know, let them know um, what your next step is because that's, that's what sometimes people don't realize. Good advice, and we're working on coming up with a pretty robust community input uh, yeah, process. I, I was just thinking, you know, we all got pretty good at communicating during COVID out of necessity, <laughs> right? Um, and utilizing those formats. Um, and I just think we probably should not go away from that because we can certainly reach a broad audience when Mayor Hardin goes on and speaks over Zoom. I know he probably hates me for saying that. Sure. But, it, but it's very effective and you can really share a lot of what's happening with the community at one time. And while we wish everyone would come and sit through city commission meetings, we know that's just not a viable option for most people. But I think most people could take 15, 20 minutes and listen to an update from the city. Time to wrap up. It's wrap up time. So you all heard Joe's presentation. You all gave glowing reviews on what you heard today. Each one, just quickly, biggest takeaway. Eric, we'll start with you in the middle. <laughs> the biggest takeaway is I just, the lesson I just learned on how to make a presentation for economics. <laughs> <laughs> Make it look good too, right? <laughs> Make it look good. I guess I got a long way to go. No, I think it's, um, I, I just think it's, you know, there's no better way to interpret what, you know, what we learned in terms of value and understanding what creates value. From our perspective though, that value has to be met with the economics and the market reality in which in this case it does. And so melding the two and looking at, you know, again, all the groups here today from physical planning, to the to the understanding of value and then the economics, I think um, you know I, I think it all kind of blends together and it was it was led very well at the beginning with that with that uh, with that presentation. Yeah, great. Dennis, uh, from a banker's standpoint, I always looked at the value of an asset buying own, owned by the owner, of the building or the land or you know the, the condo within the the building. But now I'm looking at it from a municipal standpoint and the value that it brings in tax dollars to you. So that was a little bit of a reverse twist that uh, I had never thought about before. Interesting. That's a great point. Barbara? I, I watched the presentation earlier today also, so it was my second time tonight, and I think I really needed also that <laughs> second time to take in because there was so much great information and really this idea of um, there's sometimes a, a fear of intensity and density that you know residents and even uh, government officials have and just the demonstration of how a second and third story that the value that it will add to the city's tax base um, it's just it was an incredible depiction um, just graphically to see that okay. Jeannie okay well I'm going to kind of car copy Barbara here. <laughs> but I, I think that was it too, was that it didn't have to go, you know, 50 feet vertical while obviously some of that is desirable. We don't have to do that everywhere. And we can experience a significant economic impact from the small vertical with 
the business underneath. Um, and of course, for me as a chamber, you know, having seeing more small businesses coming in are something I want to happen every day. And uh, you know, small business. I think uh, Jamie Dimon said 27 million small businesses in this country, <laughs> employing 57 million people. That's outstanding, Dave. So I'm going to, I'm a visual person, so that was awesome. The presentation was incredible. But the, the, one of the amazing takeaways for me was the value at Walmart, right? And that 15 years for a building, that's insane. So every project we work, there's a return on investment that we work. And it, we work with the appraisers. So I, I, I nerd out with our appraiser office. I'm like, wow, that's really incredible. You know, nobody else cares. But I, I was just amazed at that. And then when you think of buildings in Europe that are 600 years old, I'm like, 15 years, you gotta be kidding me. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, but that return on investment piece is huge when you start to look at that piece for, for the city, for any community. Excellent, Kona? Yeah, I think it's about building to last, right? And, and doing something that's gonna be timeless. But what I, I took away was your whole conversation about land productivity. So as a landscape architect, land planner, we really care about land a lot. And um, we care about trees, we care about open spaces, we care about all these places that make people happy. Um, because that really leads to sort of the end game, which is good quality of life. And, and so when you see um, uh, land not being valued, it really, you know, it really hurts, you know, from the standpoint of it's like, because you're like, wow, that could be so much it better. Does. And as global designers, we envision and we see places and we're like, wow, that could be that, that, or that, you know. And when you see it not happening, it's really, it's really disappointing. But we see so much potential here in Pompano Beach. It's amazing. Our, our firm's been working here for decades, and it's just so, we're so proud. We're really proud of this community, and it's just amazing to see what we've done so far and a lot more to come. Well, that's awesome. I, uh, I have to put Kim on the spot now because she doesn't know this is coming. She, she wasn't supposed to answer any questions today, but Kim's an expert, too. We, I'm, I'm really honored to be up sitting here with this panel of, of experts, and Kim, you're an expert in redevelopment. You've listened to that presentation. You listened to it twice now, like Barb. What do you, what do you think? What really hit you? What's, what it stuck with you the most? Yeah, that's a good one. <laughs> um, you know, Joe, I think the topic that you had to try to convey to the public is probably, you said the word nerd and wonky, and you, know, you use those words a lot. Um, but I think what was just so impressive is how you were able to take that entire subject and not only make it interesting, you're very funny. You, know? <laughs> you, you really are very, very humorous. Um, but you've just got such a handle on conveying the importance of, of good governance. And really cities, look, it's no fun for cities to talk about taxes and paying for services and garbage pickup and whatnot. Um, but I think the takeaway is, is the value of having that tough, tough subject in an audience um, but being able to convey it in a way that brings it home to what does it mean to me as a resident? What's it mean to me as a business? And that was just absolutely priceless. You did a phenomenal job. So, thank you. Awesome. Let's hear it for the panel. Amazing job. And let's hear it for Joe one more time. <laughs>